if you would, by turning in your hymn books with me to hymn number 155. Hymn number 155 at Calvary. And once you have found your place, we'll go ahead and stand to our feet. We'll be singing the first verse of this hymn, 155. I spend in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Please remain staying with us now as we pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this beautiful morning that you provided us with. We thank you for all those who were able to make it for the early morning service. We just pray now for Mr. Schroyer as he comes with your word upon his heart, Lord. Give him the words to say and allow us to have open ears and hearts to your word. In his precious name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Last week we began looking at some of these wonderful hymns that we sing and uh, a little bit about their background and especially about their meaning from the Word of God. And a lot of times when I read Scripture and when I look at what others have read, it reminds me sometimes of my past life, I guess. But when I was a student at Ohio University, I, I learned a lot about a man named Abraham in psychology class. Now, you all know that this Abraham wasn't the Abraham that we learn about from here. But this Abraham was a, in a family of Jewish immigrants from a city that's very, very familiar to us right now at this point in time, that's Kiev, Ukraine. And when he was born in 1908, the city was part of Russia. And uh, I'm sure that most of you figured out that the Abraham that I'm talking about was the very well-known psychologist, Abraham Maslow, who was a humanist, humanistic psychologist. And he formulated what uh, is now widely known and accepted, the hierarchy of needs. And Maslow formed the five needs into a pyramid and with uh, physical needs at the bottom. And then on top of that were safety needs, needs for love, needs for self-esteem, and needs for self-actualization. And as Christians... We're not proponents of humanism, although we may consider ourselves humanist or humanitarians, I'm sorry. But we can testify that as material creature, we do have certain requirements for our physical life. But above that, I believe that we have certain necessary requirements for our spiritual life as well. And I believe that there are at least four spiritual needs, or if you would might prefer intellectual needs, but I think they're spiritual needs in all actuality, and they're common to all mankind. Now these needs, I believe, would include the need for truth. Everyone needs to know the truth. Also, the need for love. And we're talking about a divine love, not just love for our spouse or love for our children, but it's a divine love. We also have a need for justice in our lives. And we all know that the Lord provides that justice. And we also need, have the need for forgiveness and redemption. You know, the song that we just sang at Calvary has a story behind it, as most of the hymns that we sing here do. 
Dr. Reuben Archer Torrey was the second president of Moody Bible Institute. And he received a letter from a father whose son was going down the wrong path of life. Now, Dr. Torrey was asked if he would enroll the man's son, whose name was Bill, in the Institute. And the reason for this was that he thought that Dr. Torrey and his association with the students in Moody Bible Institute would have a positive effect on his son, Bill. And Dr. Torrey wasn't too keen about this. He didn't think of his school as a reformatory. But finally, he decided to say, okay, he would do it on two conditions. First one was that Bill had to meet with him daily. And the second one was that Bill had to keep the rules. Now, in the beginning of the arrangement, things didn't go very well. Dr. Torrey thought that it wasn't going to work. Bill seemed to have serious problems, but he did do one thing. He kept the rules. But at their daily meetings, he vented a lot of frustrations. And Dr. Torrey found out that Bill was more attentive than he actually thought. In fact, <clears throat> several years later, this young man, Bill, whose full name was William R. Newell, became a beloved professor at that same Moody Bible Institute. After graduating from Worcester, Ohio College in 1891, he was hired in 1895 as the assistant superintendent to R.A. Torrey at the Moody Bible Institute. And it's said that he exhibited an extraordinary gift of Bible exposition. And many people flocked to hear his Sunday or citywide Bible classes. And over time, he published some wide known commentaries, such as Romans verse by verse, Hebrews verse by verse, and the book of Revelation. And he once said that had he not gone through his troubled years, he might never have fully understood the importance of Calvary's grace. That's the reason he wrote this hymn that we just sang at Calvary. Now the first stanza tells us about the times he spent in what he said is vanity and pride, caring not his Lord was crucified. And, you know, as we read that stanza and as we sing it, it's almost as a mirror to our own lives before we were saved, especially those of us who were not saved at a very early age. It's a picture of every lost person looking back at the four spiritual needs we referred to, the need for truth, love, justice, and forgiveness. Before salvation, the need was there, but the spirit was absent. As the great King Solomon looked into that mirror, he wrote about it in the book of Ecclesiastes. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 3, he talks about this same thing. He says, What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? And he goes on to know, and we know the book of Ecclesiastes, and we know about the emptiness that Solomon experienced. And as Dr. Schofield says, it is the result of all life apart from God. So, as William R. Newell's writing at Calvary, I believe that he's looking back and he sees that. And he's, he, in verse 2, he says, By God's word at last my sin I learned, and I trembled at the law I'd spurned, till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. And anybody that 
has been saved understands this fact. If we don't have a need of the Savior, if we don't have any knowledge of Romans 5, 8, but God commended this love toward us, and that while we yet were yet sinners, Christ died for us, the Holy Spirit can't lead us to the salvation experience. But in the second, uh, second stanza, his spiritual eyes were open. The scripture says that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God in Romans 10, 17. And eventually, Mr. Newell would understand, would hear that word of God, and it would open his eyes, and he knew that he needed a Savior. And in stanza three, he says, Now I've given to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. And if you remember the day that you were saved, you can remember the burden that was lifted from off your shoulders, the burden that you knew had been taken away. That which was once ignored and rejected for so long caused him to tremble. He trembled at the fact that he was just a heartbeat away from hell. The result of which was his repentance. His repentance to God once God showed him from his word, he had to turn from his way and turn to God for salvation. His whole life had changed. <clears throat> he now, in stanza three, says, I've given to Jesus everything. I gladly, own as I, add, I gladly own him as my king. And we all understood that. We all understand what he's talking about. His thoughts were directed upward to God. You know, James 4, 7 tells us to submit ourselves unto God. And to submit is very difficult. A lot of people can surrender, but most of us, I believe, resist the, the submitting part of it. But Mr. Newell's thoughts were now focused on the cross. And in stanza four, he says, Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. He's now fully aware of the divine love that, sent, that God sent his son to that cross for Isaiah says in Isaiah 53, verse 5, But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. You know, I believe that's the only bridge that spans from earth to heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 14, 1, 6 tells us, where he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but my, by me. And in the chorus, Mr. Newell says, Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Here we see him praising God for his mercy and his grace. As he focuses on what Paul writes in the book of Titus, chapter 3, where Paul talks about in verse 4, but after that the kindness of, and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. His mercy 
and grace is what Paul focuses on when he writes these words. And the blood of Christ provided the pardon for sin and the truth, love, the justice, and the forgiveness was received by Mr. Newell, just as we receive it, because of what happened at Calvary. And as such, we all, we all can stand fast, therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, free from the bondage of sin, and we can all do as we're instructed in Galatians chapter 5, 1, be not entangled again with that yoke of bondage. Father, once again, we are thankful for the people that we can read about that whose lives have been changed by through salvation. We thank you, Father, that our lives were changed through salvation. We thank you that we have these hymns that we can go back to and that we can sing and we can that lift us up and that we know that we are born again. Lord, we thank you for the time that we have here together this morning. We ask that your word would go forth and touch each and every heart. And as always, Lord, if there's someone here who has never been born again and they hear the word of God, might that Holy Spirit take that word of God and apply it to their hearts that they also can be born again as we are. And Lord, we thank you for all that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we pray in his name. Amen. Brother Don. Morning. That'll segue right into Galatians chapter 4. <clears throat> After you've received the gospel of the grace of God, how is it then when you knew not God, you did service unto them which were by nature no gods? But now, after that you've known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again to weak and beggarly elements? Where until you desired again to be in bondage. Why in the world, after you've received the grace of God and know the freedom and the liberty that you have in Christ, why in the world would you ever go back to what you had before? <clears throat> Simple question. And the Spirit of God is bringing this portion of the scripture to the fact that, to the place where, where Paul has, he expresses what, a lot of us express in our lives when we deal with individuals and even families who just kind of turn away and turn their back on the truth. Don't know where they go, why they do it, what's going on, but why in the world would you ever go back to what you knew before? Why would you go back to those things which, which held you in bondage? You thought you were free, you thought you had everything, but now, now life is different because of the Christ, uh, because of Christ, what's the draw of the world, the flesh, the devil, the law, religion? You, you couldn't earn your salvation before you're saved. You can't earn any merit with God now that you're now that you're saved. And are you frustrated with that? You're going to go back to the world? You're going to give up on everything because of that? Because you can't have a part in it? You know, it's amazing how many people want to pay you for doing something. You, you try to be nice, try to help, and try to be uh, an encouragement, but then they want to turn around and pay. Just say thank you. And, and it's the same way with our salvation before God. Just say thank you. But so many times we get caught up in thinking, we've got to do something for this. And Paul's telling the Galatian believers, this is not what you're to do. Okay? This is not what you do. And, and the Spirit of God gets very personal here in this portion of the Scripture. Okay? It, get, it gets very personal. And before we get into that, let's pray. Father, we praise you and thank you for your love for us. 
We thank you for the power of the Word of God. We thank you for the power of the Spirit of God that works in us and that can change us, change our minds. Change, he changed our hearts. Help us our minds to be changed, to be drawn onto the liberties and the freedoms that we have in Christ and rest in that. It's through Christ alone. We praise you and thank you for the way that you help us to walk in the light of the truth and help us to express that truth in our lives as we live day by day. And we praise you and thank you for the way that you'll work in hearts to, if there's any that are here, here that know not Christ as their Savior, if there's any that are listening that know not Christ as their Savior, help them to realize that the world has nothing to offer and is nothing but bondage and hell and destruction forever. But there's life and eternal life in Jesus Christ. And I praise you and thank you for the glory that that is. And we praise you for it in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Paul says, you knew the gospel. You reveled in the gospel. You rejoiced in the gospel. You were glad for that. He says now in verse 15, chapter 4, verse 15, where is then the blessedness you speak of? What happened to that? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. You know, where is that, that great thankfulness, that blessedness that you had when you first saved, thinking that I could, I could do anything for Christ now. I'll do whatever he wants me to do, go wherever he wants me to go, stay however long he wants me to stay. You would have you'd done anything at that point in time. But as time goes on, and here's where he gets really personal. And he gets to the place where anyone who's been a parent, been a teacher, been a pastor, and looks at those who have rejected the things that they've been taught, the things that they've been learning, <clears throat> they walk away from the truths that they've known. And we say with Paul, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? I don't know how many parents have felt that way. How many teachers have felt that way? Pastors have felt that way. I'm sure it's multitudes. I'm sure it's multitudes because when you present the truth, there's going to be a response to it. No matter what that is, no matter how that truth is presented, there's going to be a response to it. And, and it's going to be a positive or a negative. There's no middle ground. Okay? There, there's, there's, no pos there's no middle uh, electrode in electricity. It's a positive electrode or a negative electrode, and there's nothing in between. Okay. And so you're going to accept that truth or you're going to reject that truth. And, and how apt we are to feel, how, how human we are to feel that the one who tells us our faults becomes our enemy. How, I, how apt we are to treat them coldly. To, to cut them off. And just walk away. I don't want to hear it anymore. Just leave it. You know, we can, we can make all kinds of modern human arguments if you want, however you want to put it. But, you know, we, we don't like that person who has told us that something's wrong. <clears throat> And, and the reason he gives us pain is, is because we can't have pain. <laughs> I don't want pain. You, you don't want pain. I'm, nobody in this room has woke up, woke up this morning and says, give me pain. Hurt me. Okay? But none of us can have received a, a correction, a rebuke, an instruction in righteousness sometimes without uh, some momentary indignation uh, that we regard that person who told us as our enemy. Not a flat outright enemy who's going to come and kill us. That's not the idea. The, but we just, oh, wish you just leave me alone. 
We, we don't like to have another person tell us or be acquainted with our faults, our foibles. We all, we, we all put on a good show. We all look good. <clears throat> but there's one who knows your heart. He knows the interior, the exterior, the, all the way through it. And, you know, it's like David in Psalm 139. I can't go anywhere that you don't know it. I, I, can't, I can't have any thought, God, that you don't know it. And ah, leave me alone. It's human nature. Because we, 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 we don't want to submit. <laughs> <clears throat> and human nature requires no little grace for us to overcome that it takes a tremendous amount of grace for us to be able to take something someone has given to us as a rebuke, as a correction as an instruction and say thank you that's not our first response it may come later down the road when we wake up and realize, okay, yeah, they're right. And be honest. But at the moment, it doesn't work that way. We, we love to be flattered. Okay, that's just, that's just the way people are built. We love to be flattered. We love to have our friends flatter us. And we love to, you know, and any, any exposure causes us to shrink and, and to... Hmm, any necessity of repentance causes us to have a second thoughts. <clears throat> and so we become alienated from the faithful one who's trying to reprove us. <clears throat> Paul says, am I become your enemy because they tell you the truth? <clears throat> we, we get offended at at teachers, we get offended at our parents, we get offended our, at our pastors when they reprove us. And, and, and if they're godly, then they've used the truth of the word of God. And so essentially we're not really offended at them, we're offended at God. And that takes it to a higher level. And Paul says, how is it that you could, you, you could know God and love him and serve him and then walk away? How is it when, you, when we would talk to someone who's walked away from God now? How, how, is, their, how is their response? <clears throat> and so, you know, when we talk... They get, they get offended at the truth. So they resist then. What they're, what they're really doing is resisting the influence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And his, his intention, his office, yes, he's comforter, but his, his responsibility is to reprove the world. So he's to reprove the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment. You go back to, turn with me to John 16. <clears throat> the book of Galatians is not a 2,000 year old book. It's a, it's a 21st century book. It's alive today because it's, it, it's speaking to us today. Because there are so many who have received the truth and walked away from the truth. One way or the other, they're not involved in the spiritual work of the Spirit of God right now. They're wrestling with God. Or, heaven forbid, God should wrestle with them. But maybe that would be a good thing because Jacob was different after he wrestled with God. John chapter 16, verse 7. <clears throat> Now, remember, Paul had told the Galatian believers, he says, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? 
John in, in chapter 6, Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he's come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteous, righteousness, because I go to the, my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I, I've got a lot of things to say to you, but you can't handle them right now. <clears throat> and here... <clears throat> Paul is, has gotten to the place where he has to leave with the Lord. And that's where we have to leave it. There's nothing more difficult for a person, an individual, than to regard with, a, with, a, with affection the man who faithfully tells him the truth at all times, even when that truth is painful. Nothing more difficult than that. But yet, he's our best friend. Okay? He's our best friend. <clears throat> you know, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. <clears throat> and sometimes we don't want to confront. We, we all kind of shy away from confrontation. I, I, don't, I don't like confrontation. Nobody really wants to do that, because some... Too often we get into flesh when that happens. <clears throat> but there's a, there's, a, there's a need. Paul is confronting the Galatian believers here in this whole book. He said, you, you love the Lord, you trusted God, you received the gospel, you received the grace of the gospel, you've walked away. Why? <clears throat> you know, if I'm in danger of falling off a cliff, just kind of you know how people do back up, take pictures? Okay, if, if I'm in danger of falling off a cliff, the one who tells me that you're getting pretty close is a pretty good friend. Okay. He's a pretty good friend. And I'd appreciate that. He could have just said, keep on going. And if I'm indulging in a, in, a, in a course of conduct that might ruin me, the one that warns me and gives me the, the, the truth about what I'm doing, even though I don't like it, that's my, that's my best friend. He's the one who wants me to get back to where I need to be going in the right direction. He's the one who's most faithful, who warns me and, and tells me that, that, you know, if you keep going in this direction, this is what's going to happen. And the last thing we ever, ever need to tell anybody, and you got it on the tip of your tongue right now, I told you so. That's not grace. <laughs> That's stabbing it a little deeper. <laughs> okay. Paul says, I, don't, I, I, I love you, but I've got to tell you the truth. <clears throat> and so he says in, in verse 17, and so I warn you, okay, I warn you, they zealously affect you, those who would draw you away, what the world, the flesh, the devil, the false apostles, whomsoever you've been listening to has drawn you away from the truth. They zealously affect you. The word affect there is the word seek. Okay? They zealously seek you. Yea, they would exclude you that ye might affect them. And so Paul takes the false apostles to task for their flattery to the Galatian believers. And Paul calls it by good works and fair speeches to deceive the hearts of the simple. Okay? And, and that's, that happens. Okay? 
Now, we wouldn't want to call individuals who done and walked away simple, okay? But if you're, if you're so easily drawn away by fair speeches and good words, okay, you're not hearkening to the truth. The false teachers made, made, a, made a show of, of zeal towards the Galatians, and, and, and they professed a love for them and an affection for them in order to gain them as their followers. Okay? They, they buttered them up, bottom, bottom, bottom line. They were, they were full of enthusiasm and, and professed a, a, a concern for their welfare. And men who are manipulators always do that. They always flatter, always butter you up to draw you away. Okay? You, you, things are going to be better over here if you just come on over here. <clears throat> you, can, you can sing, you can dance, you can do this, that, and the other thing. It's not bad. Our music is a whole lot better than that old fuddy-duddy stuff. <clears throat> and the object of the apostle is, is probably to say that it's not all your fault, Galatians, that you're drawn away. It's not all your fault. You, they've had an influence on you. Okay? And, and yeah, you've been alienated from the doctrines which you've been taught, but, but on the other hand, okay, Okay, it's not all your fault, but on the other hand, many are drawn away of their own lusts and enticed, James tells us. <clears throat> we, we've never got over ourselves. We all like to have that pat on the back, might feel good, might have, like people to like us, want to be in the know, want to be fitting in with society, we want to be part of the community, we want to look like them, be like them. <clears throat> and, and there have been great pains to take and to draw people away and there's been a great show of zeal which would endanger anybody if we're not careful <clears throat> and so the word exclude probably means that they, they wanted to exclude the Galatians from the love and the attention of Paul, of Paul. okay if we can draw his, their attention away from Paul, then we can get them back to where we want them to be. And they can follow us instead of following Paul. And so their, their first work is to, is to manifest a special interest in their welfare. And secondly, they want to alienate them from those who first preached the gospel to them. Take them away. Come on over and visit. Just, let's have coffee. <clears throat> That's fine, okay? <clears throat> but the object to, of the manipulators, of the false apostles here in the Gal book of Galatians, and dealing with, you know, you're dealing with Iconium, Lystra, Derby, several other cities. It's not, it's not just one small group of people. It's a region of people who've been drawn away. <clears throat> and the object is, is not their salvation, but to this, to, 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 secure the love of the Galatians for them, for the false apostles. Paul says in verse 18, it's good to be zealously affected always. Okay? There's nothing wrong with that. It's, in fact, it's, it's a good thing to be zealously affected. <clears throat> in a good thing. Okay? <clears throat> and they were like that when Paul was with them, and see, that's, that's where, that's where it, 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 you know, we all have to be very careful. Okay? <clears throat> Paul says, am I becoming your enemy because I, I tell you the truth? They want to draw you away. While I was with you, you were happy, you were blessed, you were ready to do anything you want. But now that I'm going away, they're drawing you off. And Paul says, it's a good thing to be zealously affected, but... Don't let it happen only when I'm with you. Don't just show your love for the gospel, the fellowship of the believers, the, the things that have drawn you and given you liberty and freedom just while I'm with you. Be that way everywhere. 
Be that way no matter where you, who's with you and who's not with you. Not when you just come to church and then you do, oh, you're a great Christian at church, but then when you go home, you're somebody different. Don't be zealously affected only when you're amongst others who are the same way, but when you go out in the world, do the same thing. Make a difference. Be different. You are different because you're going to trust in Christ. But now they're drawing you away. You need to get back to square one here. <clears throat> Paul says, when I, when I was present with you, you loved me. Although I preached the gospel to you in the, in the infirmity of the flesh, you, your zeal is good as long as it's for a good cause. But don't let them draw you away and become zealous with them. Don't get so excited about the world, the flesh, and the devil. Don't get so excited about keeping the law and being, being a, 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 uh, one who follows all the rules in that respect. You've, 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 you've started to observe de days and months and times and years. You're thinking that's going to make you any better in the sight of God? That's not going to do a thing for you. What's going to make you in the sight of God good is just to simply trust God. Walk in the light of the truth that you've got. Be zealously affected that way, wherever you are. <clears throat> and Paul says, although I'm absent in the flesh, I'm with you in the spirit. And that's something we really need to remind ourselves. You know, we might not be together with each other all the time, but we're with each other all the time. Uh, I trust you pray for me. I try, I pray for you. I don't know what you're doing every day. I don't have no idea what you're going through, what's going through your heart, your head, your, your body. But it, it, we're, we're brothers and sisters in the Lord, and you can't separate that. You know, I've heard people say blood's thicker than water. Well, that's true. But the blood of Christ is thicker than human blood. Let's get that right. There's, there's, a, there's a unity in the body of Christ that, that overrides every other unity that there possibly could be. And we kind of played that down a little bit. And we think, oh, family's important. Yeah, family's important. Absolutely right, family's important. This family is the most important family I have. I need to be zealously affected by that. I can't be drawn away. It's easy because I want to fit. I want to be a good dad. I want to be a good parent. I want to be a good friend. But I can't do that at the expense of the truth. You know, it doesn't cut off fellowship. It doesn't cut off the communications. But there's a there's a level there. We don't come down to that level. We get up here and keep drawing them up. Whatever, what, however it hurts, however it hurts, we have to keep, you know, it hurt. It hurt God so much that he sent his son on the cross to draw me up. Well, I haven't got that far yet myself. <clears throat> So Paul says in, in, in verse 19, he says, he tells him, I love you. I, te I tell you this because I love you. He says, my little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. I hurt because of what you're going through. I hurt because of what you're suffering. I hurt because you, you don't realize how much you've walked away from the blessings of Christ. I hurt because I want to bring you back and, and I, oh, I would trust that Christ will be formed in you again. Wake up. Realize what you've got, what you've left. <clears throat> and he calls them little children. Little children. You, you can't say that harshly. Little children? Oh, I guess you could. <laughs> If you worked in a nursery, you could. <laughs> but it has to come from a heart that has a tenderness there that wants their attention. 
He means here that until, until Christ wholly reigns in your heart, until you wholly and entirely embrace the doctrines that have been given to you, until you become wholly imbued by the Holy Spirit of God, I travail. It hurts. And he uses the, the harshest human hurt there could be. I've never experienced it. I don't want to experience it. <clears throat> giving birth. He says it's, it's the same. It's, just, it's the hurt that I feel for you. <clears throat> he says in First Corinthians, he tells the Corinthian believers, he says, in Christ have I begotten you through the gospel. Okay? And it hurts that you're walking away. You're, you're the epistle of Christ ministered by us, not written with ink, Written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. <clears throat> the, the word of God heard from the lips of one who cares enters into the heart of the hearer. And the Holy Ghost takes that word and, and brings the forth the fruit of faith. Okay? And, 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 and in that respect, every pastor, every, every individual, every father who wants, who loves his children... Is, is a spiritual father who forms Christ in the hearts of the hearers. And the, poor, the false apostles have torn the form of Christ out of the hearts of the Galatians and <clears throat> substituted their own form. So Paul tells me in, in verse 20, he says, I, I, I wish I could tell you face to face. <clears throat> I wish I could tell you face to face. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice for I stand in doubt of you. That's, that's hard, isn't it? But, you know, it's, again, it's where people are. We minister, we talk, we share, we, we pray. <clears throat> they had lost much by the, by the absence of Paul. They, they changed their views. They changed their views. <clears throat> They, they had, in some measure, become alienated from him. <clears throat> and he wishes that he might again be with them. Again be with them as, as he was before. And, and, and he would hope to accomplish a lot by his personal presence. Much more than he could with a letter. Okay. <clears throat> and, to ch and to change his voice. He's been... He's been Strong. He's been. He's rebuked them. He's he's corrected them. He's also been trying to be kind and gentle. <clears throat> he said, "I want to change my voice." Now, what voice is that? When you read this, what voice do you get when you read this epistle? <clears throat> we all could read it in, in a different intonations. We can, we can all read it and, and put emphases on different words in some places. Paul says, I want to change my voice to you. <clears throat> I'm, per I'm perplexed. And Paul had a lot of reason to be perplexed. Okay? <clears throat> he, he's doubting their sincerity and, and their, their faithfulness to the principles that he taught them. And he was, he was anxious on their account. Okay. <clears throat> There's a common saying that uh, a letter is, is a dead messenger. Okay. You know, something is lacking in all writing. <clears throat> You can never be sure how the written page is going to affect the reader. You write it down, but you don't know how it's going to affect the one who reads it. Because mood, circumstances, affections, they're, they're all changeable. But you pick up on different things as you read a letter. That's why it's important to read them two, three, four times. <clears throat> I wrote a, a letter to my mother this week, but... It, you know, it, it doesn't express the heart. It's paper and ink. 
it's two dimensional and you read it and you think, oh, okay, it's about time you wrote. <laughs> okay, that's the first thing she's gonna think of once she opens that letter. It's about time you wrote. Okay. <clears throat> but it's different with the spoken word. Okay? It's different. It, if, if it's harsh and, and the timing is off, you can always say it again and say it in a different way. Uh, you know, <clears throat> it's no wonder the, the apostle expresses the wish that he could, he could speak to the Galatians in person. When you, when you talk to somebody face to face, it's a lot different than it is to write them an email or text them. The okay? problem with text is you get spell correct. <laughs> Sometimes it is correct and wrong. <laughs> <clears throat> he could change his voice in, in regard to their attitude. He could see their response. Oh, they're taking it in the wrong way. I better readjust that. Oh, yeah, they got that. I can go on a little, say a little bit more. The, the eyes can, the eyes there tell you a whole lot about life, you know. <clears throat> That's why you look at people when you talk to them. Look them in the eye. <clears throat> I have a hard time talking to somebody when they're looking over here like this. <laughs> I have, to re I have to look at lips, <laughs> okay. so cause I can see what you're saying. You know, some people say, ask that. You see what I'm saying? I see what you're saying, because <laughs> I have to get the, the way the lips make the words. But Paul, Paul wants to see if they're repentant, so he can soften his tone. He, 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 if he sees that they're stubborn, maybe he could say something a little more stern a little more earnest, a little more direct. How do, you, how do you deal with them through a letter? If, it, if it's too severe, it might cause more damage. If it's, if it's too gentle, it's not going to correct the situation. But if he could be there in person, he could change his voice and, be, and tell them what's needed. Now, It's, this is, it's the Spirit of God who's written this letter, okay? Don't ever, you know, we talk about Paul, we talk about the false apostles, we talk about Galatian believers. It's the Spirit of God who wrote this epistle. And he wrote this letter to the Galatian believers to draw them back to Christ. And his intention is, is to see, yes, they've got problems, they've got issues, but if they have the truth, they'll come back. I drew them. They belonged to me. Either that or, or they didn't trust me in the first place. Okay. But the, the gist is that they have, they've trusted and they need to return. They need to go back to, if uh, John says in the book of the Revelation, their first love. Okay. He's talking to the Ephesians there, but, but still. Okay. <clears throat> Don't we all sometimes have to do that? Don't we all have to sometimes regroup and retrack, and get back on track? You know, and when the pastor says something from the pulpit and says, oh, man, oh, when we walk out of here in a huff, it's not him. No, you, you might take it personal, okay? But, you know, the Spirit of God works through the word of God and since he always brings forth the word of God and that's all he brings forth then it's important for us to recognize it's the spirit of God that's working whether it's this pastor or the previous pastor or whosoever when the word of God is brought forth we've got no claim to say oh I don't like that no you don't like it but you better listen to it <clears throat> it's there it's not because they don't like us it's not because they don't care for us it's because they love us and they want what's best for us. And, you know, we may have to make some changes, a little tweak here, a little tweak there. That's what the Spirit of God does. He tweaks us all the way through our lives to bring us to the place where Christ is formed in us. And he is who is seen in us. None of us have arrived. Okay? So none of us can just back out of that. There's no opt out of that. <clears throat> And so Paul gets personal here. The whole, the whole epistle is personal. The whole 
Scripture from Genesis to Revelation is personal. It's a personal letter from God. <clears throat> he says, I, I love you and I care for you and I want what's best for you. Come home. Let's pray. Father, we praise you and thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the power of the Spirit of God. We thank you for the power of the Word of God. It's the power of God unto salvation, is the gospel. The gospel is good news. And the good news is that Jesus paid a price that we might be free. Free from the law, free from the world, free from the flesh, free from the devil. But so many times we, we are affected upon by the world, the flesh, and the devil, and they, we act like humans. And that's what we are. We just pray that the Spirit of God will just convict us and, and continue to change us into the image that you want for us, that we might reflect Christ. And we praise you and thank you for the way that you work in heart. So we'll thank you in Christ's name.